Quiet on set. Picture is up. All right, roll sound. Rolling. Roll cameras. Cams rolling. And three, two. Hey everybody, what's going on? And welcome to Hank's Think Tank. Got a great show for you here today. Guess who is sitting on my left? Mr. Mark Hogan. I'll do my own introduction. All right. Hell of a guy. Thank God he's here. Mark's Hi, everybody. Here, Mark's here with me today, and I'm glad to have him. He's just coming off a um, really, really hard deal shooting the Constitutional Corner with our host, Craig McMichael. Yeah, oh, that guy and, uh, is amazing. We're yeah. lucky to have him right here in Studio 13 with us. We are. And a uh, good show yesterday. I can't oh. wait till it comes out. So Tuesday, 7 p.m., it'll be out. Every Tuesday, 7 p.m. There you go. All right, I've got an interesting guest in here today. His name is Scott Wingerter. And he is the host of a podcast right here in Montgomery County called Impolite Company. Impolite Company. Yeah. I love that name, man. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good name. And I've checked the show out. It's a great show. He's got some good political commentary on. We've actually had a few of the same guests. So it's been awesome. And I look forward to what this guy's got coming out. And I wanted to have him on the show just so I could pick his brain because he's got some good production. And uh, he's an articulate guy, and you're getting ready to find out yourself. Scott, welcome aboard. How's it going, man? It's going great. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Um, you know, in checking out your show, I noticed that you've got a really casual setup, but your audio is awesome, video is awesome. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. But before we get into that, I wanted to find out, got you into podcasting. How'd you get started? I hey. kind of stumbled into it. Um, I'm... My background, uh, when I was 18, I joined the Air Force, and I went into intelligence. Uh, really? Yep. Worked at the uh, National Security Agency for about eight years uh, as a signals analyst in there. And then, Were uh, you in the side of the mountain in Colorado? Nope, never got out there. What, but, is, uh, what is the name of that place? Oh, geez. Uh, is it a secret? Yeah, it, yeah I can't <laughs> it's say. It's NORAD. <laughs> That's right. Nor, yeah. NORAD. Yeah, yeah, that. You, you know, when you're little, when a little kid lets a, a helium-filled balloon go up uh, into the sky, NORAD sees it. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah and, awesome. and they have to kidnap the kid and <laughs> see, debrief him. So when you say you're a signals analyst, were you listening to, like, radio transmissions, or what was the deal with that? So my job was... Uh, an old Cold War relic, uh, especially given the sort of mission that we were conducting when I was in the Air Force active duty. Uh, you know, we transitioned, of course, into the war on terror. In fact, I, I enlisted uh, two weeks before September 11th uh, happened. Wow. Yeah, so oh, it was wow. just a total change from the stuff that we had been doing uh, in the intelligence community prior. Uh, and most of our assets focused then of course on the war on terror but my job never really got caught up to that um you know my job was specifically designed to decrypt and intercept signals that you know were the machines were created by the soviet union and given out to all their client states all across the world and so that was really my job and it's it's tough to collect special signals against countries that don't have electricity anymore because we bombed them in the stone age right so I did a lot of just sitting on mission. I worked with the U-2 spy plane. I can't say where we were flying, but, you know, I'm sure if you use your imagination, you can probably get somewhere close. Yeah, no kidding. I bet that was beyond interesting. It was beyond boring, actually. Really? Yes. You never came across a a, a message like, holy crap, I've got to call the president right now. Uh, Nothing like that as far as my job was concerned. Now, I worked with uh, some cryptologic linguists. They were doing great things. They were in contact with people on the ground, saving lives every day, Uh, you know, listening to the enemy uh, comms. And that was cool, but I wasn't able to really be fulfilled with exactly what I was doing because like I said you know the target wasn't really technologically advanced enough to have cryptographic signals that I had to you know reverse engineer and see what this secret hidden message was they that just wasn't their mo so Hmm. I sat on mission for 12 14 hours a day basically listening to static on headphones just like this Hmm. so you're in an office building somewhere just (laughs) yep on the ops floor inside the bowels of the national security agency and the only cool thing was the only thing we had access to on the top secret computers was every day nsa would download wikipedia the entire thing 
Um, really? Yeah. And so if you got bored on mission, and I was bored on mission a lot, that was the only thing that you could really do to sort of occupy your time. So I would just sit there and read whatever fascinated me. Mm -hmm. I would find an, an article on Wikipedia and I'd educate myself, you know, as best as I can with what with, with the tools that I had available. So, I wonder why they downloaded Wikipedia yeah. every day. It's very useful. That's I'm why. sure it is, but... Uh, and especially, I mean, when you go back to, you know, the <clears throat> early 2000s, Wikipedia was a mm -hmm. little bit different of a beast. It wasn't as, you know, uh, political, if you will. Right. Uh, you know, it was, yeah. you know, yeah, you can't use it to write a college paper. That doesn't mean that the information in it's bogus. Right. You know, I wonder if they kept it like a database of those daily downloads. Well, they downloaded it every single day, the entire thing? The entire thing. Oh, oh dude, their data collections. Um, it's a monster. It's yeah. I mean, I'm sure yeah. you can. That tells me that they're looking crazy. for something new. <laughs> you know? Well, it's yeah. a great asset for your analysts to have. If you need to look up a quick fact or something like that, you know, it's, it's, that's why we had it available to us. Well, wow. so. what about North winds and stuff like that? Uh, I'm not familiar with that term. No. Okay. Yeah. They, that was the big database that, you know, from all the cell phone stuff and all that. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, they have inside the bowels of that giant agency, they have, yeah, I, I don't. I couldn't even imagine how many terabytes of data storage, you know. Yeah. And crazy supercomputers and things like that. Oh, I know. know. So, yeah, yeah it was just, cool. Yeah, I feel sorry for the guy who has to back all that crap up. Right. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's got to be a nightmare. In well, itself. every day is a whole new Wikipedia yeah. Yeah. The entire library. Yeah. 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 The name of the organization <laughs> that was inside NSA that was, you know handled all of our tech stuff it was called eagle alliance but we always called them evil alliance so. yeah oh i'm sure yeah <laughs> you know, that's put a they're... trouble ticket in you know that's evil it. alliance will get to you when they get to you yeah. so it was fun 2009 i deployed to iraq as an interrogation analyst because the army you know after you know what 10 years of war uh had been stretched so thin that they started to go for you know, Air Force and tap them on the shoulder to get their analysts over. Right. Um, so I got spun up on how to do body language analysis. And so I went to Iraq, I uh, worked at the prison there in Baghdad and would, you know, sit down with terrorists, you know, across the table, just like you and I are. And right. we would chat and I'd try to extract information out of them. Well, wow. um, so do you speak Arabic? I don't. So, well, wow. so you had to have a translator. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we would put the translator actually behind the person so that, you know, you could have a conversation yeah. and they weren't having a conversation with the translator. Right. You, know? you can't tell me you were bored those days. Man. No, that was an interesting <laughs> job. Uh, but, you know, and uh, probably the most valuable thing, uh, skill set that I learned in my career in the, in the military, because um, due to some life th things that happened, uh, I ended up getting off of active duty, moving out to Kansas City. Um, I went through a divorce, uh, which is common for, you know, a lot of sure. soldiers that deploy and, and things like yeah. that. And, uh, you know, I decided, well, gee, now that, uh, you know, I'm approaching 30 here, I got to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up. Right. So I became uh, a history teacher. I went to cool. finish my, my <laughs> college up and, that's you know, awesome. that's what I did. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you that one of the best things that I can bring to the table in any classroom is my... Uh, experience as an interrogator. Oh, I bet. Right. <laughs> and you've got global experience too, because you've traveled the world. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. What grade level? So. Um, I taught for after I graduated college. I taught uh, down in Aldine for for five years. Um, I taught at the alternative school down there. Um, so I got all the troubled kids, you know, mm -hmm. all the hooligans, as I called them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you get in, in a fight, you know, at your school. Uh, you get sent to me. If you're selling drugs, you get sent to me. So these are high school, junior high kids? Uh-huh. Oh, wow. Yep. yep. Yeah. And tough. Well, it is. It was It was a tough mission, but, mm -hmm. you know, it, those are the kids that we need to reach, and I was, you know, fully capable of doing that. I, that with the skill sets that I had, I could see trouble coming. Right. And so that, that served me quite well there. And then, you know, I just have a passion for, you know, the Constitution and history, and so being able to teach eighth grade, which is – basically from 1492 until 1877 mm -hmm. you know that was my dream job right there I, I that's my favorite era of of u.s history to, to talk about and study so mm -hmm. you know i was able to reach these kids um because 
I wasn't intimidated by them. And, right. And when a kid tried to intimidate me, I'd be like, I used to sit down with people from uh, Al Qaeda there, Cupcake. Why don't you go ahead and sit down? I'm not scared. <laughs> right. You, know? so you don't need a translator with them. No. So, yeah. No. You so, ever have yeah. to break out the waterboard or anything? Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, no. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that with these kids. But, you know. <laughs> unfortunately. It, you know, it, it was probably. It probably would go a long way in, in helping some of them. You know, some of them just need a good foot in the butt. So, oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we don't do that anymore. Right. You know? When but, I was a kid, I was used to getting knocked around because I wasn't a good kid. Yeah. And I'm just being honest. You know, I was I was curious and I was... What would be the term for that, Mark? I was... You were a rambunctious. rat. Rambunctious. You were a rat fink. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> By the way, this we're drinking today... Um, Kraken, it is a black, black spiced rum, and to me it tastes like chocolate. It's, it's very good, well, very uh, smooth. On our rum taste test show, we actually uh, had two winners, and one of them was the Kraken, and the other one was Sailor Jerry. Yeah. Check it out. Hence the big ass bottle. So, <laughs> yeah, it's mainly gone. So yeah, we've been doing pretty good, but we decided to partake in that today while we have our conversation. We need to so, get a check from these people. As much as we talk about it's, it. I'm sure it's in the mail. I'm, I'm going to call the Kraken Company as soon as we're done here. Yeah, here if go. I could get it. You know, if Yingling's watching, uh, you know, and you want to sponsor <laughs> Impolite Company, we are open to that. There so you go. go. <laughs> so from being an analyst and being in the military to being a history teacher, I mean, how'd you, how really did you end up podcasting? I mean, so where'd the idea come about? Um, well, the own, the I, I got to give all the credit to... Uh, the dock line uh studios um and they're in magnolia right correct okay. that's where they're headquartered yeah. but you know they send the dock line i'm sure your audience gets dock line magazine in their uh mail every month um they've been in print for since you know i don't know the 1980s uh they've been sending out dock line magazine and they have you know dock line magazine online as well okay um and they decided that they were going to get into the podcasting business and uh i know the owner and he's passionate about politics. He's passionate about the community. Um, and he said, I, I think you'd make an excellent person to host a show and just get out there and, and talk. And bam. Um, I, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it literally just fell into my wow. lap. Yeah. Last year, I, uh, I actually, about a year ago today, I uh, um, resigned from Aldine. Okay. Um, my wife had some health issues. Uh, I was finishing up my master's degree in history. It was my mm -hmm. last semester, and it was going to be way too overwhelming to, you know, be driving down to Aldine uh, five days a week and doing all the things that I had to do. So right. I made the decision to, you know, resign. Um, my kids go to this private school called Paideia Classical School. Okay. Um, and my wife works there. She's the, you know, at the time she was the registrar. She's the accountant, and she does a variety of jobs on the back end there. And she was looking at the staffing, and she's like, we don't have a history teacher. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> and she's like, please. And I'm like, no. She's like, for me? I'm like, well, because you asked me, I will. And then that opened up this great opportunity for me as well, and I mm -hmm. didn't realize how much I was really going to love it. It's I, I'm a firm believer in classical education. I think that that's by far and away the best form of education that mm -hmm. a person can get. Um, yeah, I agree. And uh, so I walked in and I started teaching culture of history there. Um, and uh, uh, something happened with the, the, the headmaster at the time where it was a family issue and it was personal and she didn't have the time anymore to be able to dedicate to that role. And they're looking around and they're like, well, you have 10 years of experience in education, Scott, so why don't you be the headmaster? And so I said, okay. And so now I'm, I'm doing that. Uh, I'm the headmaster of the Conroe location. Uh, okay. We are accepting new applicants, by the way, and if you are <laughs> wanting to enroll your kid in a really good classical uh, Christian school, uh, check us out online. Uh, but so that's what I do now. So Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, I focus on my podcast, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm you know either teaching history or running a school. So okay, so you're shooting three a week. I try to shoot about two a week um, and use one day for planning. Mm -hmm. um, okay, if I can get, I I try to cast a wide net. Um, sometimes I do just a you know monologue. Um, you know, if you ever listen to talk radio, you know, top right. of the hour type of format you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes on a topic. Um, 
or I'll do a uh, long form interview. <clears throat> and I, I specifically chose the long form interview, not because it's sexy and not because it sells well and not because the numbers are going to shoot through the roof, mm -hmm. but because that's what's actually more important in my view is that long form interview because you're able to get down to the nitty gritty, the details, and really, <clears throat> especially with some of the political candidates that you're right. can, able to have on the show, you're, I look at it as a service to the community. I'm vetting these guys. You know, if you're going to come in and you're going to throw your hat in the ring for an office, you know, I don't want the only thing to, that I hear from you is either, you know, a candidate stump speech. Yeah, your, your or, standard speech. Yeah. Right. Or, or, you know, a 30 second, you know, clip you know right right i, I, I yeah, don't we're really know what you really yeah. believe and we're doing the same thing on the show here and i have noticed that too that you, you get you get 10 <clears throat> minutes to talking points and campaign ad and then mm -hmm. as you get into the conversation it gets into more of the nuts and bolts of who they are right you mm -hmm. know yeah exactly and you know i want a diverse field of candidates i want the, i want to establish uh, in our community here in montgomery county and this is why i love your show too is we need to establish as citizens a, a community that has this goal in mind where we want a diverse crowd of people, we want a diverse group of ideas present, and we want to be able to really sift through those ideas mm -hmm. and choose who the best candidate is out there that's going to represent our interests mm -hmm. because that's how you get control back of, of government whether right. it's local level, state level, or even, you know, at the federal level. You have yeah, to be the, informed. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the thing that I like about it most is it gives us the opportunity to do voter education. That's right. Because it's really, really hard when you're looking at commercials, when you're looking at print, to determine who's who. But mm -hmm. when you get a chance to sit down and eyeball them, and you get a chance to sit down and ask them what questions you have, right. and then you have enough foresight to think about what questions your audience might have, well, now you're doing voter and education. That's, that's right. Anyway. And that's more of a service than you even really know because what you're creating is you're creating a group of intelligent voters that's right. to go out and really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so, and what I was convicted to do that specifically <clears throat> when, when this opportunity fell into my lap because, I, you know, for the last five years I've been teaching kids down in Aldine and, you know, yeah, they might be the, quote, bad apples, but, you know, you get those kids down, you sit them down, and you actually – or if you have the classroom management, they're just bored. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, a lot of it. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. A lot of them are really, really smart kids that's kind of fell through the cracks and, you know, they're just bored. And so they're going to cause trouble. So if you can feed them what they're really looking for, which is, you know, an in-depth analysis of right. how the Constitution is supposed to work, for example, you know, and then I'm convicted because these kids are sitting across from me and they're like, well, mister, why don't you run? You know, why don't you get into politics? What are yeah. you doing? You tell us that this is really super important. You know, you know, you should be doing more. And I'm like, you're right. I should be doing more. And so, you know, I'm taking my education background and that's that's what I'm just simply applying to the show. Mm -hmm. And that's really the goal is I want smart people out there going into that voting booth and pulling the lever. Yeah, but see, you got to be careful because here's what happened to me. Now, during the 2022 M said race, East Montgomery County Improvement District. Mm -hmm. I had basically interviewed every candidate that was on the ballot. And then we did an open forum. So we did a public forum. And uh, out of that, what happened was there was a small group of individuals that decided that I'd be great for that job and decided to write me in. Oh, At the no. last so, minute. Like, yeah, last The last minute. two or three weeks. <laughs> and, 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 I mean, there were texts. There were signs. There were signs there were, on the highway. Yeah, there was there was a lot going on. Yeah. And, it really wasn't good. It, it damaged some relationships that I had mm -hmm. and kind of hurt me a little bit. Right. But I learned from it that you really got to be careful and let people know, hey, if I was going to run for this, I would have filed for it in the beginning. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And, and I mean, I was thankful for people supporting me and thankful that there was a group of individuals that thought that I had enough intelligence to, to fit that bill. Sure. But yeah, I wasn't the guy for it. I mean, I'm more of same as you i'd rather educate the public yeah. and get people prepared to go out and pull the lever and make an effect on a local level mm -hmm. than be that local level yeah you it's know what I mean? it's definitely calling i mean i've been asked to run for precinct chair for the republican party i'm active in republican party politics here in montgomery county uh and you know i just i that's my feeling as well 
uh, that's a whole nother ball of wax right there. I don't know if we oh, want yeah. to open that can of worms, no, but <laughs> you know, I I see it as I'm able to do way more good uh, outside of right. that political, especially party politics, mm-hmm. uh, than than in. From we can within. avoid a lot of those other yeah, obligations. It's driving from the passenger seat is what it is, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, yeah, you can you can make a lot of progress in that in that position yourself. So yeah, I'm glad. And I'm glad there's somebody else out there that's kind of doing the same thing. Right. Because it really is so important. And if you go to the Internet and you try to find information on these guys, a lot of times you can't find anything but what they put on their website, Mm -hmm. which is going to be generic. Mm -hmm. You can look at all the candidates' websites, and they all basically say the same thing. That's right. So everybody's going to go for the big issues. But I think what it really boils down to is what kind of individual is it that's running for office. Right. You know, And the only way you're going to get to that – it's like you said, long form, good conversation. Well, get them to loosen up, start talking about their life. That's right. And their past and, and how they feel about things, where they are on certain elements of the Constitution, stuff like that. Yeah, the, the framers of the Constitution were very clear in their writings. And this is where, you know, forgive me, the historian is going to come out. Uh, they were very clear in that we cannot maintain a republic without a virtuous people. Right. And... If especially if you're going to throw your hat into that ring, mm-hmm. you need to prove to me that you are a virtuous person as well. You know, I don't need to agree with you on everything. You know, I don't need to, you know, we don't need to go to the same church. You can have different right. theological views. <clears throat> you can have different views on, you know, some political issues and everything like that. And that's fine. But the virtues in you know, comparison to an understanding of natural law, which is universal in its application. If you can't articulate to me what that means and what that looks like, to me, that su- signals that you are actually not the person for that job. Because it says in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by the Creator of certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's the purpose of government. You know, right. is you're there to protect my rights. And if you can't articulate to me what that even is, how on earth can you defend them? Right. I like it. And the founders yeah, were all good. very adamant on the yeah. uh, solid moral uh, grounding. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Even even some of them, like you know Madison or you know Benjamin Franklin, they weren't you know super Christian or anything like that. In fact, if you know you sat down with some of these guys, and you know you probably wouldn't let them take communion with you at your church right. r- currently. Yeah, I heard but, Franklin was a drinker, man. He oh was, yeah. yeah. I mean, he was he, he was, was a, a party animal. Too. That's was right. He? Yeah. Yeah. Believe it or not. Oh Look yeah. Franklin, huh? Yeah, he uh, he uh, he went to France and almost got shot by many many <laughs> men. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> He's Get down, he, Ben. That's it. <laughs> he knows what That's I'm talking about. Yeah, no, that, that is absolutely right. But, uh, you know, he still looked at life and respected those cardinal virtues. And this idea mm-hmm. of virtues goes back for, you know, 2,500 years. You know, right. that's what Socrates is talking about when he's walking around Athens is, you know, know thyself. That's the whole purpose of philosophy. You, you know, I can't change Hank that. I can't do it. The only person that can do that is you. Right. And you can't do that until you are reflective upon your own life. Um, And so that's where knowing yourself and knowing, you know, uh, these, this concept of virtue and what that looks like comes into play. Uh, The way I teach it in my students is this, this is the lens in which we view the world right here. Mm It's truth, beautiful, our beauty and goodness all right mm-hmm. everything that's true these are all objective terms okay everything that is true is beautiful everything that is beautiful is good everything that is good is true everything that is true is good everything that is good is beautiful and everything that's beautiful is true and if that's the lens in which you see the world it changes how you see everything um, so it's super important and yeah. the, yeah. all of the founders, all of the framers of the Constitution, they they got that kind of education, and they got that from the classical uh, mm-hmm. education. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it was Buddha or who, but somebody had said that anything beautiful is equally as brutal. Hmm. 
And I thought of that, you know, a couple of years back, I went to Colorado, we were up in the mountains. And, you know, you're, you're standing there, you look out, you go, God, it can't get more beautiful than this. Mm-hmm. And you turn 180 degrees and you go, God, it just did. Mm-hmm. You know, you turn around again you get, and you can't believe how great it is. But then when you think about what goes on there, mm-hmm. you know, with with wildlife and, and just the amount of death that goes on. Yeah, the food chain. Yeah, the food chain. Yeah. It does make me believe that anything beautiful is equally as brutal. That's a fascinating idea. I mean, even the mountains themselves has to go through this violent, you know, right. uh, exercise of being pushed up between, you know, two fault lines colliding together is what right. makes those rocky right. mountains. Yeah, that's, and it looks that's beautiful, brutal, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But don't wa- don't try to climb to the top of it without a bottle yeah. of water. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, um, so I think that's it's unusual, but it kind of adds to what you were saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and people take issue with beauty in particular as one of those cardinal um, um, a priori truths, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, we are told. Mm -hmm. Um, And there is, to a degree, some subjectivity to beauty. I'm not going to disagree with that. Right. That's not what I'm talking about. You demonstrated it perfectly when you just told us about those mountains. Mm -hmm. You said they were beautiful. Right. Now, there are 7.5 billion people on planet Earth. And is there a single one of them, if I took them up to that view that you were just explaining, would say, well, that's an ugly-ass mountain over there. <laughs> yeah, there'd be more than one. Yeah, yeah. Not a s- nobody would say that, right? right? Nobody sees a sunset and they're like, that's ugly. Or, <laughs> you know, a, I, I challenge you, you know, just Google, uh, you know, babies playing with kittens. I dare you not to smile. Oh, yeah. You will smile. Sure. And that's natural. And that's what makes it an a priori truth. It's self-evident. Right. You know. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I like it. That's pretty cool. So, in your show. Yes. I want to talk about the first show. Because, like, my first show was a beautiful disaster. Mm -hmm. So, I had a couple of guys who had recently gotten out of prison. Uh, Both of them had master's degrees. One of them was the author of a book. Great book. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, had those guys in here. We talked for about an hour and 40 minutes. It was my very first show. I was terrible at audio, terrible at video. The shots were awful. But the content the audio was, was Yeah, the content amazing. was great. The conversation was mm-hmm. great. So after the month and a half it took me to edit and get the thing put up, it was the most horrible piece of work I've ever seen right. put out on the Internet. And I'll never take it down. That's Because good. it was the best thing that ever happened as well. Yeah. So how was your first show? Uh, my first show I had as my guest, a good friend of mine. Uh, she's the president of the Hispanic Conservatives of Montgomery County. Okay. Um, uh, my wife serves on that board as well. And then I'm um, uh, a, a member of, of the club as well. And uh, I'm actually one of the, uh, uh, I'm on the advisory board for that. Okay. Um, and so she, you know, I reached out to her and I was like, hey, I want you to come on my first show. Uh, and she agreed. And it was rough. Um, technically, um, from the technical aspect, because mm-hmm. we were just learning how to do all this. Uh, you know, right now we have this bus where we hit A and it takes camera A and camera B. Right. Back then we were, you know, had two specific cameras set up, both with SD cards in, both filming at the same time. And then the guys had to pull those cards. And do a multicam edit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that took forever yeah. uh, to do. Um, and so... Content wise, I think it was a, it was good. Uh, a lot of it was I had my t- my team at the dock line. Those guys are good. Mm-hmm. You know, this is not their first rodeo filming something. The audio was good. The cameras are 4K professional, awesome cameras. Right. So like all of that looks so good. So the shots were great. Mm-hmm. Audio was good. Yeah. Right. Shots were great. Audio was good. Um, content i think we, it went too long it was about an hour long show mm-hmm. uh it was one of those long form interviews but mariana's a pistol uh so yeah uh it was good she let loose and it was it was awesome um and you know i had a couple more bumpy shows after that uh, i interviewed um some of the 
county court law judges. Uh, this was right before the primary season. I was trying to get as many candidates in there as, as possible. And, okay. you know, I, those, I'm, I'm not trying to take away from the importance of those positions. Those are very important positions. You know, I had John Hafley on. Um, I had Hafley on. Yeah. I had. Uh, good man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. General Hafley is an awesome guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, and he yeah. did good. Uh, I had um, Echo Hudson on, um, and I had uh, Amy Tucker on. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, and those, I actually had Laura Watson on, who was running against yeah, Amy. Yeah. yeah, I know Laura as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, Laura's um, great. Yeah, so I had those. Those were, I think, my first four shows, if, if memory serves. And you know, it was, I was stumbling through my words, and you know, it's weird. Cause so were you nervous or were you just stumbling? I mean, because it happens. I think I was yeah. just stumbling through, and it was it, yeah. it's different. And I mean, I act differently on camera than I do, and I thought it would be simple. You know, I <laughs> I talk for a living. I'm a teacher. That's yeah. what I do, right? You know, right. what's the what's the problem? It's, this is going to be an easy transition. Well, you know, I can't. I you know, every teacher, I don't care who they are, they have a, some form of uh, ADD, right? And they're always moving around as sure. teachers, right? Yeah. And that's what I'm used to doing when I teach. Uh, and to be forced to sit here in position and to stay in frame is, mm-hmm. is difficult for me. And so I had to learn that skill. I had to learn how to, you know, articulate things better. Mm-hmm. Um, what I just did there. Um, I'm still trying to get rid of that. Uh, ah, that's not a big deal. That's just <laughs> human. Uh, you know? One of the things that I didn't even realize that I was doing was, you know, you know, the 14th <laughs> Amendment was written in, you know, That's awesome. or, until you, you know, it played back to you. Yeah. yeah. And then I've I'm got a bunch there, of those, I'm sure. So. Yeah. And you're just sitting there and you're like, you know, you say, you know, a lot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that goes back to exactly what we were just talking about. Right. Know, know thyself. How are you going to mm-hmm. get improvement in your life? Even if something as simple as, you know, right. right. You got to reflect upon what it is that you're doing and you improve. Um, and, you know, I just did. <laughs> <laughs> so were you addicted after the first show? Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I love doing this. Uh, yeah, see, if I, I got addicted bad. Yeah, I mean, yeah. After that first show went up, and I got like two views, and uh, one was my wife, and one was a friend or something. I was like, man, I'm in. That's it. Yeah, I'm, this is what I'm gonna do. Well, it got really crazy for mm-hmm. me because I hit it big. You know, relatively speaking. I mean, my YouTube channel was up for seven days, and uh, I did a video. Uh, in fact, the guys were out on location shooting and I walked in and I was like, we need to do this video now because something big is going to happen. And mm-hmm. I just filmed it on my iPhone. Um, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> so it was not the same quality as you're used to seeing on Impolite Company. Um, but I just did it anyway. And it was all on the, the title of that podcast uh, episode was uh, Putin's invasion plans unfolded. And I filmed this on a Wednesday and I can't remember the exact date, but we got it. There was no editing, really, because, you know, there, I, it was on my iPhone, so we okay. just we just published it. Uh, it was published at 5 o'clock in the afternoon here, te- you know, Texas time. Okay. Uh, at 11 o'clock at night, that night, Russia invaded Ukraine. Oh, wow. And my video was, like, the only video on YouTube that had anything to do with that. Um, and so... I got 7,000 views on that. So you had the keywords that everybody was typing in. Exactly. And I just happened to do it. And so I saw that coming. That was, that was my history experience. And that was my, you know, Intel analyst hat that I put on. I'm like, yeah, he's going to do this real soon. So, you know, I wanted to get that done uh, and out and it, and it happened to work out. Um, Another thing that I did was that was really cool. Uh, I knew exactly what Sleepy Joe was going to say at his first State of the Union. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I filmed prior because I had a a prior engagement that I had to be in um, when he was doing his State of the Union. So I filmed it beforehand. I saw that. Yeah. And you got like 10,000 views on that. I did. Yeah. And so that premiered literally. The president was like, all right, well, good night. Thanks, folks. Uh, And walked off, you know, the stage there at the Capitol building. And then um, 30 seconds later impolite company's response uh premiered it was perfect and that's cool yeah i beat and I it be- was shot prior so yeah really you didn't even know what he was well you knew what he was to say but you didn't know what he was gonna say. yeah exactly it was just cool yeah i, I took a gamble it paid <clears> off <throat> yeah for you know my claim to fame there is you know for a while uh you know i had more uh views on my state of the union than somebody like ben shapiro so 
Really? That's great. Yeah, I mean, he blew me out of the water rather quickly. Oh, but, yeah. you know, for those for those 30 seconds, I had Ben. <laughs> I had his that, number. Ben. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> so what do you see for the future of podcasting and the future of your show? I think video podcasting, like what you guys are doing and mm-hmm. what we're trying to do at the dock line is, you know, the future that's that's where everything's heading um think it'll take over mainstream media i certainly hope so um again it's uh, i guess i'll try to explain it like this the the smartest thing i've ever heard i'll drop this for you all right smartest thing i ever heard was uh how philosophy was founded um A man walked up to one of the old philosophers, you know, pre-Socrates, and said, I want to know what the one thing that everything is made out of. What is it? And so the guy went away and thought about it, came back, reported. He said, all right, everything is constructed out of one of four elements. There's earth, there's air, there's water, and there's fire. And, you know, the man who had asked the philosopher the question, he said, well, that's very good. I see what you're saying there, and I don't necessarily disagree, but you gave me four things. I asked for one thing. What is the fifth element, the quint essence, the quintessential element, the thing that binds them all together? And that's really what philosophy is about, right? Mm-hmm. You are looking for unity and diversity. Now, if unity and diversity can even coexist peacefully at the same time, uh, then it would have to be present in the first cause. Um, and the only worldview in which you see both unity and diversity present in the first cause is in Christianity, where you have unity and diversity in the Trinity. And mm-hmm. I was like, right? And so I use that as a, an analogy of what we're doing. You know, what are we trying to do? We are trying to bring a diversity of thought to our community here in Montgomery County. And we're trying to get out of that unity. We're trying to bring together this diverse group of people with all of their thoughts about how community should work, you know, be it politically, economically, uh, just, you know, even socially here in Montgomery County. How are we going to bring all of this together to form one cohesive community? Uh, and that's difficult to do. Um, it's, right. it's literally why we have it on our coinage, e pluribus unum, out of the many one. That's what we're trying to achieve here. And the mainstream media is not trying to achieve that. No, they're out for our time. That's all they want. Right. Yeah. But, Money. you know, and I, I spoke when we were talking on the phone, you know, uh, to set this interview up. You know, I told you, I don't look at you. I don't look at, at Hank's think tank even though we cover some very similar topics, you guys aren't my competition. Right. You know, we are allies. We are on the same team here trying to do the same thing, and I like that because it is that diversity of opinion, Mm -hmm. but it's also directed towards the same goal, and that's what I'm all about. And that's really what I think podcasting really should be, especially on the local level here. And, you know, I think that, we just have something to offer that the mainstream media is never going to be able to put their hands on. They won't be able to figure it out. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I think was, is, as long as we keep doing our job and getting people to watch and listen to what it is that we're trying to do and listen to their voices as well, then we bring them into that. It's, it's, a, it's a shared mission and goal. Um, and I think that that will change the world. I really do. Right. Bring more people into uh, thinking. Yes. Think for yourself, mm-hmm. and you decide what you believe. That's you know? right. But get into the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. what I've tried to push is that it starts at the local level. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody gets fired up about what's going on in Washington. Yeah. And we can't change anything that's going on in Washington. No. But you can go to your city council meeting, and you can eyeball those councilmen mm-hmm. that you voted for. Yeah, that's right. You Castles, know? school boards. And, uh, yeah, it starts there. Yeah. You know, I mean, you fix that. And you fix that on a really big level, and you fixed everything else. Yeah, you know, absolutely. without even trying. Yeah, and it's a ridiculous notion. Like, I mean, I know Kevin Brady, but can I call Kevin Brady right now? He's right. probably not going to pick up the phone. I ser- certainly can't call Senator Cruz or Senator Cornyn. Right. You know, they're not going to spend the time that they have with me. You know who I can call right now? I can call Cecil Bell. I right. can call Steve Toth. Those guys will pick up the phone and talk to me. 
I know them. Mm -hmm. They live in my community. Right. You know? And that's what it's supposed to be about, you know, is government should be the, the federal government's, you know, as Mark Levin says, is a leviathan that's just gobbling up more and more right. and more and more. Uh, I, I would like to see federalism restored uh, all across our country and for communities to be self-governed. And that's really my passion. Yeah, we've moved away from that idea mm -hmm. big time. Right, and I think it's a huge mistake. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And we need to get people to buy into it. I mean, when you look at what caused something like Athens or even Rome to fall apart, um, both of them, Athens, for example, you know, if you were a citizen of Athens, the, you were given 10 acres of land and it was yours. It was your farm. And if you mm -hmm. wanted to plant olives over here or you wanted to plant, you know, a grape vineyard over there or whatever you wanted to do, it was yours and you got to decide that. Now, what happens when the Persian army with its, you know, 200,000 soldiers come marching in and want to take your farm? Well, you know, are you going to stand there and defend it yourself? No, you lock shields with the guy next door right. and the guy next door to him. And they have a vested interest in protecting your farm because their farm is also in peril. And it's that buying in that we're missing today in America. And if right. the citizens would buy back in, then we could actually achieve self-government. And when we lose that, that's when, you know, democracy uh, in the case of Athens or right. the Republic in the case of Rome falls. Well, we got to get back to the truth, number mm -hmm. one. You know, getting back to the truth will be a great start in buying back in. And then also, just like you said, instituting a cohesiveness in community. Yeah. You know, get people to start believing again that they can make a difference. Yeah. And believing that that certain elements exist that aren't defunct. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. And that's going to be the hardest thing is getting that on a local level the community. Oh, I think we're making big strides I think so you know? but I still think it's the most challenging part the the other aspect uh, this is my personal belief here is another thing that we need is an article 5 convention of the states uh, we need to amend the constitution uh, for example the 17th amendment we need to get rid of the 17th amendment that's the direct election of senators mm -hmm. you know the three of us have no business voting for Ted Cruz John Cornyn right. as our senator that should be the legislator's job you know mm -hmm. um I can't campaign for, you know, Congressional District 8 and, you know, get elected to Congress and, and you know, on the idea that I'm going to get rid of the 17th Amendment because I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> it is you really well. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I could see the TV ad now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Scott Wiener doesn't believe in democracy. <laughs> he doesn't even want you to have a vote for your senator. You know? Scott Wiener <laughs> hates seven-year-old kids. Right. <laughs> But if you can get it through an Article 5 convention of the states where you can kick it back to the state legislatures and then they, they're they responsible. Ted Cruz doesn't represent the people of Texas. Ted Cruz represents the state of Texas. Right. And, you know, if you have the power put into the law that, you know, each time something comes before the Senate, your state house and your state Senate is voting on how they want their... Uh, senator, because they're the constituents mm -hmm. to vote, I think that dramatically changes the ability of the federal government to keep gobbling up uh, more and more and more. You're returning that power back where it belongs to the states. Right. That's an interesting point. Yeah. I like it. All right. All right. Well, Scott, it's been good, man, and I'm glad you came out. Thanks for driving all the way out here to check hey, us out. Hey, it was my pleasure. It was a lovely drive. And, I got to uh, see some trees. Yeah, it's good to Mark, meet you, man. You got anything? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess I could kind of take a little left turn here. Man, that jacket is badass. Oh, thank you. And what is that made of, like shark skin or something? Uh, you know, I don't know. I bought it on the clearance rack at uh, Express. Cool. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, it's just really cool. Yeah. It's so smooth, and I mean, I'm going to get me a jacket just like that. It, it's one I'm of my go-tos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So thanks for being here, man. Hey, it, was it was really a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for the rum. Thanks for the Kraken. I highly recommend. It's very smooth. Release the Kraken. Like, does it taste like chocolate to you? Maybe mm. a little just it's, a, it's got, got a little chocolatey it's thing. It's got a little going. chocolatey taste. It does it. have a hint of that, yeah. 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 See, I mean, the Coke was covering stuff. it up a little bit, but there you know. You go. Maybe recommended. I should be a man and just drink it straight, huh? All right. <laughs> All right, guys. So there you have it. So it's impolite company. So go to YouTube, check it out. It's a great show. 
Um, it's a casual atmosphere. I think you'll like it. And he's going to be doing a lot of stuff in the future. And I hope to have you back on, too. That would be Because this pleasure. is a good conversation. Yeah, I think we'll, we can get into all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. Let's so do it. So that'd be awesome. Yeah. We'll have you on, too. There you go. How's Sounds that sound? great. Great. So, guys, go there and check it out. Let me know what you think. Leave me some comments about Scott. Tell me what you thought of him today. And go to his show, subscribe, and let me know what you think of his show, too. We're both in the same game here. We're both trying to do the same thing. So we need all the support we can get, and we get it from you guys. But we also give it back as well. For Mark Hogan, I'm Hank Vatt. This is Hank's Think Tank, and guess what? We're going to finish our drinks, but we're going to do it off camera. See you later, guys.